Good evening. I'm Marion Dry, Chair of Class Act HR 73, and it is my honor to welcome you to this Class Act Forum update on Ukraine. Class Act Forums bring experts and activists together to educate all of us about the issues we face in this complicated time and to provide us with strategic information about actions we can take to contribute to making this a better world. I'd now like to introduce our moderator and panelists. Our moderator, Bill Crystal, is a founding director of Defending Democracy Together, an educational and advocacy organization dedicated to defending America's liberal democratic norms, principles, and institutions. Bill has long been recognized as a leading participant in and analyst of American politics and has helped shape the national debate on issues ranging from American foreign policy to the meaning of American conservatism. Early in his career, he served in senior positions in the Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush administrations. Mark Kansian is a senior advisor with the Center for Strategic and International Studies in their International Security Program. He has held positions in the Office of Management and Budget, as well as the Office of the Secretary of Defense. And at Harvard, he led research and executive programs at the Kennedy School. In the military, Mark spent over three decades in the US Marine Corps, active and reserve, serving as an infantry, artillery, and civil affairs officer, and on overseas tours in Vietnam, Desert Storm, and twice in Iraq. Peter Galbraith is an author, academic, commentator, politician, policy advisor, and former United States diplomat. From 1993 to 98, he served as the first U.S. ambassador to Croatia. He was a cabinet member in East Timor's first transitional gov government, and in 2009, Peter became an assistant secretary general of the United Nations, serving as deputy special representative for Afghanistan. He also served two terms as a Vermont state senator and was candidate for governor of Vermont in 2016. Finally, Roger Meyerson is the David L. Pearson Distinguished Service Professor of Global Conflict Studies at the Pearson Institute for the Study and Resolution of Global Conflicts at the University of Chicago. He is the author of Game Theory, Analysis of Conflict and Probability Models for Economic Decisions, among many other publications. He's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and of the National Academy of Sciences. And he was awarded the 2007 Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences in recognition for his contributions to mechanism design theory. It is now my great pleasure, Bill, to turn it over to you. Thanks, Marianne. And it's good to be with everyone here and really particularly an honor to uh, moderate this panel with these three not just distinguished, but intelligent and uh, interesting panelists who have such a diverse uh, diverse backgrounds, this real distinction in their own fields of military affairs and diplomacy and economics, but also uh, involved much more broadly in our public life in, in so many ways. Mark, lead us off with uh, what's the current state of the war? What's up with the counteroffensive? What, where do the combatants stand? What, what might we look for in the next months or year? If you go back about a year, the Ukrainians launched two offensives. One was uh, east of Kharkiv, uh, and the other was around Kherson, and they were both very successful. The one east of Kharkiv uh, drove the Russians back. The Russians had second-class troops uh, defending the area. They collapsed, uh, and the uh, Ukrainians moved forward quite substantially until the Russians could reestablish a new line. Kherson, the uh, Russians were on the west side of the river, uh, came under a lot of pressure. The Ukrainians were using some of their long-range um, uh, artillery and the HIMARS missiles. Um, the Russians uh, found it untenable and pulled back. Now, they did it quite skillfully, but it meant that uh, the Ukrainians had captured another large chunk of territory, including the city of Kherson. Uh, then the uh, Russians conducted a partial mobilization. You probably heard a lot about it. It was very chaotic administratively, but it did produce a lot of troops. The Russians got those uh, troops into the front lines and then in late February launched an offensive of their own. That ended up focusing mostly around Bakhmut and many people have heard about uh, Bakhmut. The Russians were trying to pinch off a 
Ukrainian salient. They had been able to do that back in 2014. They tried again, they failed around Bakhmut and it became just a slugfest uh, between the Russians and the Ukrainians, a little like Verdun had been compared to. And of course, Wagner uh, ended up being deeply involved, particularly in the latter stages. Arguably, this was the battle that really uh, broke uh, Wagner. But the Russians offensive petered out. Offensives always do. They can only last uh, you know, a couple of months. Troops get tired, logistics run out. Uh, and then the Ukrainians, of course, built up for their counteroffensive. And uh, that was much anticipated. Of course, the United States, NATO had sent them a lot of equipment, done some training, uh, you know, probably looking back, not enough, but, you know, time was short. Uh, and the Ukrainians launched their offensive in June. It immediately ran into trouble. The Russians had had six plus months to dig in. They had built a defensive zone with multiple uh, lines of defense. They had obstacles. They uh, had minefields, which were particularly difficult uh, to get through. And the Ukrainians got hung up in this defensive zone. Uh, so they paused for a while and decided to uh, restructure their tactics. You know, they had led before with a lot of the tanks and armored uh, vehicles that they had received from the West. Uh, they um, uh, re-engaged the offensive, but mostly with infantry and their engineers. And of course, that's slow, very expensive. And they were sort of chewing away at the Russians from June or at this point in July uh, up until about a month ago. Uh, they attacked on about four different axes that became quite controversial in the Pentagon. Some people were saying that that was too many. They should have concentrated. Others said, no, look for a weak point, then reinforce that. We're not going to get into that. And I don't think that we'll be able to... Uh, come to a decision on that and really until the war is over, we have more uh, information. They made a little progress um, in the uh, south around Zaporizhia. For a while, it looked like they might break through. They moved forward maybe about 10 miles, but then uh, petered out. And you know that's basically where we are today. The Ukrainian offensive is over. It's been over for about a month. The initiative has actually turned to the Russians who are attacking um, south of Bakhmut, uh, Adivka, same sort of situation, small town, Ukrainian um, salient. Uh, both sides are pretty exhausted. <clears throat> and uh, I think the fighting will um, peter out over the winter. It won't stop, but uh, both sides will build for perhaps a um, offensive in the spring. And I think one of the big issues on the table for the Ukrainians is uh, what is the theory of victory now that we've uh, been stable on these front lines for really almost uh, a year. Thanks, Mark. Maybe we'll Peter go first. If the war is temporarily at least stalemated, diplomatic implications of that, I mean, short, medium term, uh, in elsewhere in Europe, which has been maybe pretty staunch in supporting Ukraine, a little more than I might have expected, and, and, and he back here, what, what, what do you take from this as a veteran diplomat who's been in the middle of these wars going back and forth. In terms of support, yeah, I, I think that the longer the war goes on, the support diminishes. I, I think the country where it's greatest at, at greatest risk here and with most consequential is the United States, where for whatever reasons, and you've been such a terrific voice on the other side of your party, but you know, significant elements of your party have become the party of isolationism or even the party of Russia. So that's an issue. Uh, but the same phenomenon is in Europe, but less so perhaps because they are closer and because the European countries are not as polarized as ours. But what about the uh, negotiation? Uh, I don't see that. Uh, I think it is politically impossible for any Ukrainian leader to come to a negotiated solution. Maybe you could have a, a ceasefire for a period of time. But in terms of uh, you know some kind of territorial deal, uh, I think that would be suicide because it wouldn't be accepted by the um, Ukrainian people. Any kind of deal the, Rus the Russians and Ukrainians could conceivably make, such as a concession of territory to Russia in exchange for Russia making peace, the precedent everybody should remember are the two Chechen wars in 1994 to 96. The Russians fought the Chechens. Uh, and, uh, and 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 ultimately let go of that because they, uh, they, they they were suffering too many too many losses. They spent the next four years 
building up uh, their their army. And when Putin became head of Russia in late 1999, they relaunched the Second Chechen War to utterly conquer Chechnya, and and now it is basically run by a Russian uh, viceroy. Uh, who who's, has dictatorial power over, over the Chechens. The Ukrainians cannot make peace while Russia is what it is. And either Putin has to change his, his tune, or uh, which seems extremely unlikely, uh, much more likely is the Russian people start expressing their objection to continued war. And for that, it, they have to be exhausted. The Ukrainians are exhausted. I will say one of the, you asked about the Ukrainian GDP. Uh, it is going, it has been going up this year. Of course, they lost a lot last year. GDP figures are ridiculous because they don't take into account the negative of things that are destroyed, but productive capacity to make make weapons for war, to, to pay people to go do things and to and to to make things, uh, to replace things that were destroyed and to make weapons to attack the Russians. The Ukrainian economy, the Ukrainians are working hard. They are exhausted, but they are still determined. Thanks, Roger. Mark, one hears about Crimea and the original, we should just review for 20 seconds, maybe the, the history. Putin seizes Crimea in 2014. He comes back in with a full-out uh, assault, as the Ukrainians call it correctly, in twenty, in February 24th, 2022. Uh, he gains a certain amount of ground. I think the Ukrainians have gained back, what percentage of that? I mean, they've got back they've, about half of what they lost. Almost half of the ground that they that was Putin gained in 2022, which is pretty striking, actually, when you think about it, I think. Um, but then it gets tougher, as you say, with the defensive fortifications. What about the Crimea stuff, the attacks on the ships? It does seem like that's been a little bit of a surprise that, that the Ukrainians seem to be doing better there, than given, which is kind of amazing. They don't even have a navy, do they? And, and, and the naval warfare, they're sort of <laughs> causing damage to the to the Russians. Let's talk about that. Yeah, the Ukrainians don't have a navy anymore. <laughs> the Russians uh, destroyed what they had. But you're right, the Ukrainians have been very... Uh, ingenious in their ways of striking at the um, Russian Navy and have essentially driven it from uh, Crimea off to their bases uh, to the east. And they've also pushed the Russian Navy offshore so that whereas early in the war, the Russians had been conducting a very close in uh, blockade. Now they have to stand uh, way off. And they've been able to do this with uh, long range missiles, some of which they uh, adapted from what they had, these Neptunes, uh, and some of which uh, you know we gave them or we have supplied to them. They've also had these um, autonomous, uncrewed um, surface vessels uh, that they have been able to um, drive into Russian ports and attack Russian uh, ships. So it's really a very interesting situation that the Ukrainians have been able to contest uh, sea control without having any surface ships or submarines? Well, uh, two questions, I guess. The first is, and this is a side question, but I think people will be interested in 90 seconds on this. And how much do the autonomous sea vehicle, vehicles at sea, but also obviously in the air, the drones, how much are we seeing the beginning of a whole new era in warfare? I mean, that's sort of a big question, I know, but it's one that is a bit of interest to you as someone who's been so involved in acquisitions and, uh, and other matters at the, at the and, uh, strategy at the Pentagon. Uh, and do you, it sounds to me though that you think that the Crimea stuff isn't unlikely to be decisive. I mean, that it's, that no. it's, okay. Yeah, no, I mean, and the problem is that, you know, this war is not going to be decided at sea. Uh, what We're knocking off able... their communications through the Kerch Bridge and all that stuff that that's not ultimately going to drive that, Russia that, out. No, uh, and the reason is, remember, the Kerch Bridge has only been there for like, I don't know, 25 years or so. Yeah. You know, you know, for centuries before that, they supplied, uh, you know, Crimea uh, by ferries. Uh, and, you know, minimal, uh, to keep Crimea minimally supplied is not that difficult. Now, they can make life very uncomfortable, but no, they aren't going to drive uh, the Russians out of Crimea. On this question of drones, I know we're getting close to the end here. You know, you get three different domains. You know, in the air, we haven't seen very much use of drones. Both sides have really been able to push the other side back. Uh, the air defense uh, capabilities have been very uh, strong. On the ground, you know, we've got a, a lot of drones, particularly for reconnaissance. And, you know, that has been a uh, distinctive aspect of this war, unlike previous wars. Uh, I've heard that the Ukrainians are going through 10,000 drones a month. Now, these are small commercial drones for the most part, but that's, that's a lot. On the other hand, you know, 
when people say, well, this is revolutionized warfare, I say, you know, I'm looking at this war and it looks a lot more like Verdun than it looks like, you know, what we used to think the 21st century uh, warfare was going to look like. If someone had said, you know, 20 years ago that the key munition for this war in the 21st century is going to be unguided artillery shells, you know, they would have said, no, 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 no. I mean, you don't understand modern warfare. It's going to be long range precision strike. You know, that's just so... 20th century, but that's, you know, turns out to be, you know, the number one, uh, which is not to say that long range precision strike Gimlers, Excalibur uh, are unimportant, but, you know, the, the, just the volume turns out to be really important. This is the largest war in Europe in 80 years. I mean, the degree to which people are not quite, in my opinion, grasping the magnitude of what is happening. So there are these ups and downs in the sort of strategic and tactical situation, but it's a big picture matter. Putin invading a neighbor, full on invasion, attempts to basically conquer it and really destroy its people as an autonomous people uh, in Europe on the border of what, six NATO nations now? It's a pretty uh, astonishing thing to be happening. This is a war of attrition. That means anything, each side is hoping to just win it all. We, we were hoping this summer for a, a military breakthrough by the Ukrainians. Uh, anytime one is hoping for a military breakthrough, a decisive military victory, one should pinch oneself. After all, for example, the entire history of World War One is the story of all the great nations of Europe hoping for, in the near future for a decisive military breakthrough. And, and I say that to, rem to just remind us that more harm can be done to civilization by, by excessive hopes for a military breakthrough than anything else. But then, then the other side is each side is watching for a sign that the other side will crack. On that note, let me, the most important statistic I would like to read into the record while the while the United States Congress is mulling its commitment to Ukraine, we are now spending about total, we've been running at about $75 billion a year of the first year of the war. Uh, the, I'm, I'm counting you know, military and civilian assistance to Ukraine. For, it's about uh, 45 billion, I think, uh, roughly in military aid and another 30 billion in economic or f financial assistance to the government of Ukraine. But 75 billion, that's 0.3, three tenths of 1% of GDP. Can the United States, and by the way, the total defense spending is, is running, what, about $900 billion a year. So it's about 10, it's less than 10% of our defense spending. We are spending uh, only about 3.6% of GDP, which is basically the low uh, in the whole post World War II period. We've never been that low as a fraction of everything we make on, on our defense. Can the United States spend 2% of GDP long-term to counter Russian aggression? We did uh, for, for, for much of the late 20th century, and therefore 0.3%. This is less than the standard deviation of the fluctuations of, 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 of defense as a fraction of GDP in the 21st century. It's indistinguishable from statistical noise in, 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 our, in, our, in our fluctuating G defense spending. Uh, Yes, we can afford to spend it. The European Union is spending somewhat more than, than the United States. Uh, it's most the EU as an institution is spending most of what it gives in direct financial subsidies to to the to the government of Ukraine to keep Ukraine afloat. Uh, the Germans are also giving a, a substantial amount of uh, military assistance, like we do. So, the Europeans are certainly giving much more than the than the United States is. Uh, the European Union itself is giving more than the United States. And then the German mem the member states of the European Union uh, are giving are are giving substantial amounts, and no longer in the European Union, the UK is a sub substantial donor. Canada is a substantial donor. In terms of fraction of GDP, everybody's in the range of about a quarter to three to three quarters of a percent of GDP. Or, uh, most of the, except the Baltics and the Scandinavian countries, some of them are giving more than one percent. They they know that the Ukrainians are fighting a war. This is a this is a good deal by the, I would argue, by the standards of which we judge defense spending. This is the Ukrainians' fight. We are not committing our soldiers. We are not committing our friends' lives. At this point, our fellow Americans' lives, we Americans. The Ukrainians are exhausted. They, they are hurting from this. But as far as I can tell, their determination is absolutely firm. We just re read into the record one more time uh, that uh, the last time the Ukrainians uh, 
uh, allowed the, the the Kremlin to uh, to come in and force their way in and take over was was in the Russian Civil War. And within 15 years after that, the Kremlin arranged a murderous Holodomor that that killed uh, roughly 10 percent of the population. Uh, and uh, the the Ukrainians remember that they they remember a long history, uh, and uh, they they are absolutely determined to be the nation that they are have have become. Thanks, Roger. One, one question I'm interested in is Peter. Do you think we are is our um, and Mark, Mark on the defense side and Peter on the uh, State Department and civil side are we organized? How well or not well are we organized to do this to to carry out the kind of policies we want to. Thank you for that question, Bill. It seems to me we are doing it right. And why? It has nothing to do with organization. You began this by, uh, uh, at least my introduction, by talking about the Balkans. And I would argue that what we did in the in the Balkans was a huge success. You know, we brought the war to Bosnia uh, to an end. We negotiated a peace agreement. We ended the, genocide, the uh, Serbian assault on Kosovo. Uh, and we and the end result was that Kosovo became an independent country. And we did that in Bosnia. Not a single American soldier was killed, not a single NATO soldier was killed. And we did it at a cost of about 30 billion dollars. Kosovo, an 88 day war without a single American casualty, without a single NATO casualty and at a cost of probably 30 or 40 billion dollars. So why? It is because we were funding a local partner to accomplish what that partner wanted to accomplish. In Bosnia, it was the survival of the state. In Kosovo, it was to uh, uh, end the Serbian um, repression and, and to become independent. Compare that to what we did in Afghanistan and Iraq. We came in. Now, in Afghanistan, we began with a local partner, the Northern Alliance, and then instead of letting them run Afghanistan, we decided we should run Afghanistan. And we, we imposed a highly centralized constitution on the country. We sent in billions of dollars in military support. Uh, we spent um, uh, we, we, we billions in, in restructuring the, you know, of, of advisors and uh, restructuring the Afghanistan government. 20 years, $3 trillion. Uh, I'll just tell you, I made my first trip to Afghanistan on February 14th, 1989, thanks to our classmate uh, Ben Pinky or Ben Azir, who arranged it for me. Uh, that was the day the Soviet Union withdrew. And the expectation was that the Soviet puppet regime would be quickly overthrown. In fact, it lasted another three years, two uh, a year longer than the Soviet Union. The democratic government of Afghanistan that we supported didn't even make it to the date of the American withdrawal. Now, what's the lesson? In Ukraine, we're supporting the Ukrainians to accomplish their objectives. If we take took over that fight, I think it would not go nearly as well uh, as, as, it, as it's been going. Uh, so, and in terms of a, a bargain, I said Afghanistan was two to three trillion over 20 years. Uh, Iraq was four trillion. And there is so much more at stake in Ukraine in terms of American security than there was in either Afghanistan or Iraq. So, so all of this is um, we're helping somebody else in, in their struggle. And uh, it is much better than if we try to do it ourselves. Yeah, and you give the Biden administration or the U.S. government, let's just be not political. I mean, pretty high marks for the diplomacy with Europe and keeping the alliance together and getting Europeans to do more and so forth. Absolutely. Keep, uh, keeping the Europeans to, together and in, in a uh, approach of, of escalating uh, support for the for Ukraine. Uh, first, it's been, you know, as Ukraine has demonstrated more capability, uh, there's been more support. But let, let's not diminish the, the, the you know, the, the risk of a all out war with Russia. I mean, if we had a nuclear war and it's not, you know, not completely impossible. I mean, right. you know, we, uh, it, you know, it would be. Well, it'd be the end of life on our planet. So uh, it would be catastrophic. So, you know, th th there is a, a place for some caution in all of this. But, you know, as Ukrainian capabilities have increased, as it, the risk of, of Russia taking extreme actions has diminished, uh, more support, more sophisticated weapons have gone to the Ukrainians. And at least in 2022, uh, they they did make a, a big difference, as Mark pointed out, uh, 
uh, Ukraine recovered about half the territory was taken. Mark, what about the Pentagon? I, I have friends in the administration and, and they spent half their time complaining to me about the Pentagon. God, you just can't get them to do stuff quickly. They're resistant. They're worried. They have all these, you know, this bureaucracy to go through. God knows what the, the acquisition is. And the other half of the time, I've got to say, they're saying, boy, this is the fastest we've ever seen them move. Some of the stuff really behind the scenes is kind of heroic, actually, the speed with which we've gotten weapons to them or helped arrange for European weapons to get there without taking credit for it sometimes. And finally, I'm just curious on this. I, I've been told that the U.S. and NATO training of the Ukrainians beginning after 2014. Let me start with the question of training, uh, which is critical and doesn't get enough attention. We focus on uh, weapons. You know, we look at Javelins. We look at HIMARS, uh, F-16s, being, you know, Patriot. Uh, but training is at least as important as the weaponry, arguably even uh, more important. Uh, to give a sense of scale on training. You know, many of the new units that the Ukrainians raised at the beginning of the war got maybe two weeks or three weeks of training. Uh, the U.S. Marine Corps, before it will send someone into combat, gives them 22 weeks of training. So to give you a little sense of the difference in scale and you know just how important uh, that is, we did a lot of unit training uh, in Europe uh, after the war began. I mean, that was useful, but we couldn't push enough units through. We probably pushed, you know, maybe 5% uh, of uh, the units through when we really needed to push almost all of them. But quite through. a lot between 2015 and 2022, right? Uh, I mean, there was some, and that was very helpful. Uh, the problem is, you know, you, you're doing it at a relatively low level. You know, we were capped at about $300 million a year. You know, some of that was aid. Um, I mean, training was helpful, but, okay. you know, the, the, Ukrainians expanded their military by a factor of, you know, whatever, four, something like that. So, yes, it was helpful. But okay. what we really needed was to get that other 75 percent. Um, on the question about whether the U.S. is organized correctly, uh, I don't know if the problem is organization. The problem is expectation. That is, after the Cold War, our expectation was the future wars were going to be short and intense. So we did not build large stockpiles of equipment or munitions because you know, the wars were gonna be short. And in fact, that was our experience. As a storm was short, you know, the, uh, uh, the high intensity phases in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan were short. Uh, so we forced defense industry to shrink. Uh, there was the famous last supper in the 1990s uh, uh, when, you know, the, the heads of all the defense industry got together, we're told, uh, we can't keep you all in business, you got to start uh, consolidating. So they did that. Uh, now, the problem was they became, they sized themselves to be efficient, uh, producing at peacetime rates. And that was fine until we get to Ukraine, when we're you going through munitions and equipment at a, a very high rate. And just to give you a little sense, with one example, uh, Javelin, which of course got a lot of attention early on, uh, we were producing javelins at a rate of about a thousand a year. Uh, we had an inventory of about twenty thousand, and we gave eight thousand to Ukraine. So about forty percent of our inventory, we held the rest back for other po possible conflicts, like in North Korea. Uh, and then, you know, whatever we produce, you know, we send to Ukraine. But at the rate of a thousand a year, you know, that's you know, maybe a hundred a month uh, when they're firing. Uh, hundreds of, per month. Now we're trying to get the production rate up and the department uh, DOD to its credit is is moving to do that with javelins. They're getting it up to 2000. They want to take it up to four, but to get up to four, you've got to expand the facilities, you know, a lot of regulations uh, about that. That's going to take uh, years. Same thing with artillery. Before the war, we were producing about 7,000 rounds uh, a month. Uh, we got that up to about 14,000 early in the war. We're at about 28,000 now. We want to get it up to 100,000. Problem is the Ukrainians are, are shooting somewhere between 180 and 240,000 a month. So uh, now the Europeans contribute some and we scrounge the world markets, you know, for whoever will sell us ammunition. Uh, but, you know, we, we've got just a long way to go because our expectations about what a future war might look like were way off from what we're experiencing here. No, that's so interesting and important insight, I think, about government and life in general, maybe. Um, Peter, what, uh, what's at stake and um, how will this end? So what's at stake in, in many ways is the entire international system uh, that's existed since 1945. 
if you think of uh, what was the source of wars, what kind of wars were fought up until 1945, it involved countries seeking to seize territory from another country or take the country over altogether. And what the post-45 settlement included uh, and what is in the core feature of the United Nations Charter is that once you are internationally recognized, you're a member of the United Nations, your territory is internationally recognized, you do not have those kinds of wars. Now, yes, they're territorial disputes. Uh, obviously, one is going on right now uh, between Gaza and Israel, um, or, or the Palestine and Israel. But those are those are unre th th those were not if they're not internationally recognized uh, uh, borders in the same way or Kashmir. Um, I, but in the case of Russia and Ukraine, uh, uh, Russia uh, recognized uh, the borders of Ukraine. There was zero dispute. This is not, a, as Ron DeSantis said, this is not a, a territorial dispute. It is uh, literally the invasion by one member of the United Nations uh, of the territory of another member. It happened once in the post-1945 uh, period. Saddam, the unfortunate Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. The UN system worked as it should. The entire world ganged up uh, against Saddam, and he was quickly ousted out of uh, of Kuwait. Uh, if Russia is able to get away with this, you know, it obviously opens the door uh, to others, uh, to a whole world that was what took place for centuries up until 1945. So that's huge. Uh, two other things I'd like to cover. Uh, first, I, I, I'd just like to say a word about what was it that Putin was trying to do, because it also leads to the question of how it might end. Uh, and I know this will sound a bit odd, but Putin had been president of Russia since December 31st, 1999, so 23 years. And frankly, when you've held the same job for 23 years, you want to do something different. And uh, so... Uh, you know, the, that, the, the idea of doing something great, he's a guy of a certain age, uh, slightly younger than we are, but not much. Um, so what what is it he wanted to do? Well, I don't think he wanted to recreate the Soviet Union. I, I think he had an idea and has an idea that, uh, you know, the Ukrainians and the Belarusians are all part of the greater Russian community. And uh, he wanted to bring them back together in, 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 in some kind of... Uh, Federation. And, uh, you know, and this was what Russia's propaganda has been, what Putin has been saying. And the truth is, the first victim of propaganda is always the propagandist. He came, he has come, he's persuaded himself that all of this is true. And of course, uh, he persuaded himself that this would be accomplished very quickly because there really weren't Ukrainians. Uh, anyhow, uh, uh, half the population are native Russian speakers, including, of course, Zelensky. So it be done in three days. And that's the second thing. that uh, Your military is always most powerful the day before you use it. Uh, and once they start using it, it ceases to be powerful. But of course, everybody's telling him he still wants to believe that that, that victory is possible. But there's another factor there, um, which is you, you can see this if you if you talk to Russians, and I have a number of friends there, uh, including people, incidentally, who are in the sort of government circles. Almost none of them thought this was a good idea. Uh, and there's a wonderful clip. If I can find it, I'll put it in the chat. Uh, but you can Google it. The Guardian, uh, just uh, two days before the invasion, uh, he has a National Security Council meeting in which he humiliates the head of the foreign intelligence, the SVR. And not only did he hum humiliate him, because the guy clearly didn't believe in, in an invasion of Ukraine, but they he then broadcast it. Well, if you have elites who have great doubts about it and it's not going well, then at a certain point when things get tough, as they did for the Greek junta, as they, you know, as they inevitably, the Argentine junta, I mean, there's nothing worse for a strong man than launching a war and not winning it. In fact, as uh, your former boss, boss George H.W. Bush could say, even winning a war isn't always great, but but launching one and losing it uh, is 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 terrible. So you have to think if as, as things get rough, are those guys going to be standing with Putin? Probably not. And the 
other way, um, the other people who are changing are the elites. Now, people talk about Russian public opinion. I think I'd be much more interested in what the children of the Russian elites are thinking. Hey, people like us in the Vietnam War, it, was, it, you know, it wasn't that the American people turned against the Vietnam War. It was the children of elites who you know, kind of went to our parents and, and helped change things. And, and that has to be going on after all. Who are the Ukrainians? They're people who look just like us. They half of them speak Russian. You know, they aren't people uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, so, uh, you know, I I, I think if, if if the optimistic scenario, it is that kind of change in Russia which brings it to an end. The alternative uh, is less good, uh, obviously, which is that you have some kind of indefinite stalemate, a, a frozen conflict such as exists on Russia's borders in in Abkhazia, South Ossetia. Uh, Transnistria, which I've been to a number of times, is different, but it is a kind of frozen conflict. Yeah, that was that was fascinating. I mean, the other, of course, but really bad alternative is we, for various political reasons, reduce or cut off aid. Europeans follow suit or decide this is and they're not going to send money if we're not, or send aid if we're not. The European, the Ukrainian parts of the Ukrainian, there's Russian disinformation in Ukraine, which exacerbates divisions. I mean, that would be, of course, or, you know, it's not inconceivable that. One could pull defeat out of the jaws of stalemate here, I suppose, as well as uh, as yeah, well yeah, as. Yes, but I, I would. I mean, the, one of the casualties of of um, what some people in your party want to do is not necessarily going to be Ukraine; it's going to be American leadership. Well, I know I agree with that. And, and the you know, I mean, Europe has a lot more resources than than they can bring to bear, and it, it, already, I mean, it, it give the first two decades of this century. Um, you know, with the diminished American uh, leadership as compared to what it was in the 90s. God, that was the best time to be an American diplomat. Mm -hmm. but, but, you know, if, if we now pull out of Ukraine, which is right on Europe's borders, I mean, it's, again, it's not Afghanistan, it's not Iraq. Uh, you know, it isn't that, uh, isn't just that things the Ukrainians will hurt, surely they will, but also that American leadership will be hugely diminished. Mark, uh, Roger, comments on uh, how it ends or what's at stake or what we might look for? Looking back at the beginning of the war, I have, I'm going to say a little sympathy for Putin, which is, I know, a dangerous thing to say. Uh, but I have sympathy in the sense of the misjudgment that he made. We have to keep in mind, this was a near run thing. You know, that first week, you know, it could easily have gone the other way. You know, if one of those assassination teams had got to Zelensky, if Zelensky had not uttered his famous, you know, line, you know, I, I, I need uh, weapons, not a helicopter, um, you know, the Russians might well be in Kiev and might well have won the war. Uh, there are also some actions, hostiles, you know, airfield. Uh, and, you know, the Russian thinking was not, I think, crazy in the sense that <clears throat> uh, if you look at the Russian military, of course, it's performed very badly. But if you look at their, their record, you know, in 2008, they invaded the country of Georgia. They did very badly. They won, but they won ugly. They went through this enormous reform effort. They got rid of about a third of their officer corps, uh, increased training, increased procurement. Uh, then they took that military into Crimea in 2014. It, you know, it wins rapidly, uh, almost bloodlessly. Uh, and then they go to Syria, you know, where they... Uh, launch a campaign that's extremely brutal, but also extremely effective. So then you roll around to 2022, you know, it's not crazy to say, you know, I think this military is going to do pretty well. Um, and, uh, you know, hindsight is always, uh, uh, you know, 2020. Uh, I would say Elliot Cohen and I argue about this almost every day. Uh, but uh, I, I, I guess I want to emphasize the contingency of history. No, I'm, I'm very sympathetic to that point of view for myself. And, and I would just, I mean, I wrote a piece a couple of weeks ago, could this be Putin's century? I mean, if, if, if Putin succeeded, I mean, tragically in most of what he has tried, has succeeded in much of what he has tried to do for the last 22, 23 years, including at home where it wasn't obvious in 2003 or six or uh, that he would succeed in becoming in effect a dictator and quite a ruthless one and, and exporting uh, violence, both at a mass scale as in Syria, but also killing people in different countries and Europe and basically getting away with it. I mean, that's what one, you know, and, and until the, this overreach, but which was a fairly close run thing. So I think that I, I very much agree that people are a little too confident sometimes that, you know, the arc of history bends towards justice and all that. And, you know, but 
Um, I, one, one hopes that's the case and one has some faith that that's the case ultimately, but Putin has not had a bad run from his, unfortunately, and it's really is tragic for the Russian people, among other things, and certainly for Ukraine uh, and for people in Syria and so forth. For the uh, In this, he's, he's played us pretty well. He played Germany quite well for many years. Say a word of Roger, you're on the economic side. I say what struck me when I was in Europe a couple of times, but in this earlier in 2023, was the, well in late 22 was their worry and pessimism about the energy situation and the dependence on Russia, especially in Germany, of course, and the apparent kind of amazing speed with which they seem to have more or less liberated themselves. That's an exaggeration, I suppose, but uh, from Russia dependence and, and what does that? T- I mean, were you surprised by that, or what does that tell us yes. about? Yes, I was surprised. <laughs> yeah, yes, the the Europeans have not given as much military aid as the United States. Uh, but they've given more money and they've given economically by giving up their 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 cheap Russian gas, the natural gas, which doesn't flow into a world market the same way because it's, you know, the cheapest thing to do with it is to put it in pipelines. And the Europeans have made real sacrifices. And uh, uh, Viktor Orban t- may talk about uh, pulling, you know, uh, vetoing EU support but uh I, I he's he's the head of a small country and he knows it and everybody else knows it um it is certainly possible that the united states next year could elect a president who uh chooses to pull us out and and i think peter's absolutely right that that this will this will make it you know be be a disaster for america's position in the world and disaster for the world but the ukrainians will not necessarily don't assume that ukrainians don't keep fighting in in, in that um, you know, downside scenario. They they can fight, and they they they, and I would expect them to. Uh, I sure hope that doesn't happen. Because by the way, I think when Peter talks about the world order that we've had since 1945, I just want people to think for a little bit about how many nations will want to get nuclear weapons uh, once the this principle, if 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 Putin ultimately triumphs in this principle against uh, the taboo uh, against conquest of a recognized. UN member goes by the boards. There are a lot, of, you know, and 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 for each country that gets nuclear weapons, that stimulates another country to fear it. Mark is absolutely right. The battlefield is a dangerous, unpredictable place. In those early days, things could have gone differently, as in every battle, um, every major engagement of of, of forces. Uh, but things did change. Things, did. but I want to remind people. There's a big question that we, we we didn't really face quite enough when we when we met here a year ago. In March and April of 2014, a very low level Russian subversion totally succeeded. First, the, the, you know, in, in the, well, I want to focus on the Donbas. Uh, there were Russian military troops in in Crimea, but in the Donbas, there were there, in Donetsk and Luhansk, there was a very low level subversion. There were plenty of people there who did not want to be part of, of Russia, wanted to stay part of Ukraine. And the ability of the Ukrainians to fight was to, to resist was very weak. They had just come through a revolution. It was comp- but in, in 2022 we saw just the reverse. It was the Ukrainian people. I I actually don't think it was important. I, I Zelensky said the right thing, but if Zelensky had been less of a hero, I think the Ukrainian people were going to fight anyway. Things were different. Military reform made some difference. Uh, the low-level conflict that Putin was waging between 2014 and 2022 upset those Ukrainians who had previously been sympathetic to, to Russia, saw Russia as an aggressor. The Ukrainians made some reforms, and one of the most important reforms that I want just just to let people know how things differ from, from Afghanistan. The Ukrainian national elites had a totally centralized system pre-2014, and they decentralized, they created local government units and 60% of personal income tax, which is less than it sounds because they uh, they have a value-added tax also, but 60% of everybody's personal income tax went to their municipality. Uh, new, 1,400 new municipalities were created. And this was a popular thing. When the Russians were subverting Donbass, everything was centralized, and there was nobody willing to stand up and lead in the communities. In every community in Ukraine today, there are elected mayors, elected councillors, people who, who who have responsibilities in the government and have recognized leadership in their in their in their in their community and ability to mobilize. And they have been a part of the secret weapon. The the NATO assistance that helped to reform the military was also important. 
Zelensky has been a has been a very very good leader, but uh, but the system is different. In Afghanistan, there was never local government, and the, go the government that we were supporting was all run from Kabul, just like Ukraine was in 2014. And things are different. You know, I, I think it's it, it important not to underestimate Putin. He, it, he, he, you know, Russia was a total mess when he took over. And over the last 20 years, um, the quality of life in Russia for lots of Russians has significantly improved. And, and, you know, I've been a visitor there over the years. You know, the place physically looks uh, very different, very much better, and not just in Moscow, but it, as you travel around the country. So, you know, that that th there is a reason why he, he wins elections, um, and not just because he rigs them, but because there is a, a base of support. Um, the, the, the second point I would make is, if you were Putin, and, and I think this is always a good question to ask, what, what would your strategy be now? Well, uh, here we are one year before the American election. Uh, uh, there are people who are running, who, uh, in fact, a candidate who seems to be Pre prevailing, uh, if not overall, but in the key battleground states, who says that, you know, wants to cut off all support to the Ukrainians, and who anyhow has been very friendly to Russia. You know, it, it, wouldn't that be a pretty, I mean, what, what is his incentive now uh, to make any change? Uh, uh, and frankly, and this is why, uh, not just for the sake of our own democracy, Bill, uh, but which I also consider to be extremely important, but frankly, for the, you know, for the sake of Ukraine and, and for a liberal democratic world order, the work that you're doing is, is so hugely important. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, that he, Putin has a strategy and, and, you know, again, put ourselves in his shoes. Um, uh, that strategy is, is going to be reasonable. I'd make one final point of analysis. You know, whenever we talk about our side or our allies, we, we talk about us as some noble purpose, uh, you know, uh, we're doing this and that. And when we talk about the other side, what is it that Putin's interested in or Assad is interested? Uh, well, they, they, it's regime preservation. Well, uh, you know, that probably isn't how they look at it. And again, I think it's, a you know, Putin thinks certainly uh, on uh, February 21st of uh, uh, 2022, he thought of himself as very successful and with good reason. I mean, he'd won a whole bunch of elections. Things were a lot better in Russia. Russia was much stronger. Uh, he he was pursuing a, a, a noble vision in his view, you know, not so different from what the, some of the people in the George W. Bush uh, uh, administration were viewing when they thought that by invading Iraq, they could remake the Middle East. They weren't doing regime preservation in the U.S. They had a vision. It, we can agree or disagree about it. But I, th I think it's important to when you would analyze how the other side, not just to attribute, you know, all the most base motives to them, because then you don't understand their thinking. Let me throw out a couple of questions, just in general, to capture some of the spirit of the questions, and then ask each of you to comment again on, on that or on particular things that have been raised. I think on the nuclear issue, I'm interested in Mark or others. I mean, I do think people underestimate if Putin wins, partly because he deterred us from doing war with weapons, because it was perceived, and Biden suggested this a couple of times, that it might lead to a nuclear conflict, doesn't that really hypercharge the incentive for everyone to decide, hey, if I want to cause trouble in my neighborhood or even defend myself in my neighborhood, being a nuclear power seems like a kind of a nice uh, get out of jail card or, a, you know, don't don't intervene too much against me card. Now, one can also say we have done an awful lot against Putin, so maybe it's not as much of a card as as he thought. I'm interested in the civil society question. Peter, you've worked on this in so many parts of the world. I, someone I know who's in Kyiv, went to Kyiv to, and has lived there now for, for most of the last year and a half, um, was really made, I had not thought about this much at all, made this point about the local associations and the civic associations and how much there was a sense of the American, so to speak, the Tocqueville art of association in Ukraine. And, and that, that was really helping. And, and it wasn't all just depending on one person or even you know, Zelensky's powerful leader, of course, but one person in, in Kyiv. So I'm, I'm curious what uh, on either of those matters um, or on other other things that have, um, but the questions also on the weapons, I guess, maybe Mark, I mean, how much difference would it have made if we had been more aggressive on some of those weapons? How much difference would it make today? Or basically, would it have been, been pretty marginal? So all those, I don't know, maybe just go around Mark, then Roger, then Peter, and then and then close it out. 
Yeah, uh, first on, on the nuclear weapons, uh, yeah, Putin rattled his nuclear saber a lot in the first six months. I haven't heard much of that yeah. uh, recently. And, uh, and, and I'm not 100% sure why that was, uh, but it certainly did have some effect. And I think many countries will look at what happened here and look at Ukraine and say, boy, were they foolish to get rid of their nuclear weapons. Uh, you know, they would not be in this situation if they uh, had retained those. I mean, there were some technical problems about uh, right. about that. but uh, Which incidentally, they got a kind of guarantee, didn't they, of their security in return for giving up those nuclear weapons in 1994. So it's even worse than Peter said in terms of being a UN member state. It's, I mean, they, we had, we in Britain, I think, sort of signed something with Russia and Ukraine. Where was that, Bucharest? Somewhere to... Uh, yeah, 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 we did. We did. And, you know, and now, of course, you know, our retrospective is, well, we weren't, you know, guaranteeing their territorial integrity, right. humma, humma, but okay. On the question of, you know, weapons and could it have made a difference, I mean, I think the short answer is if, if we knew back on February 22nd what we knew today, uh, then we would probably have done things differently. I mean, we had, we had known it was going to be a long war. Uh, we could have taken actions that took a long time. Uh, you know, tanks, for example, or F-16s, which, I mean, I think are useful. I think that they get too much attention. But there's a lot of stuff that we I think we would have done early on um, if we had known it was going to last for uh, 18 months. You know, at the end of the day, I don't think it would have fundamentally changed it because you have two problems. I mean, one is, you know, the ability of the Ukrainians to absorb it, but you also have this training problem, you know, and, and you know, I, I think that was a greater problem, is a greater problem uh, than the weapons uh, because, you know, you're, you're uh, I mean, your troops don't have the individual skills, but also your staffs, you know, don't have the staff training to do complex operations like getting through a minefield, where you have to get all of your uh, uh, combined, you have to do combined arms. You have to get all of your arms working together. You know, that takes a lot of practice. I mean, in the, you know, say in the Marine Corps, you know, and in the Army, you know, there's a one month program out in California to do that. Uh, and that's after you've built up to it. Uh, and if we had been able to send all of the Ukrainian battalions and brigades through that training, National Training Center for the Army, 29 Palms for the Marine Corps. Um, that might have made a difference, but you know, um, uh, that was not possible. Yeah, that's interesting. Roger, what, what about uh, whatever you want, want to say? Well, I'm curious on the work. economic front. Yeah. People I know are quite optimistic if if you about Ukraine's future. If, if I mean, <laughs> if they can get past this, which is sort of like one of these, you know, big yeah. ifs. <laughs> but but that it's actually a country that has great, pretty good, well, very good, maybe economic prospects as part okay. of if integrated they, into Europe. Is that do you agree with that? Agricultural products, know how, and by the way, now they have some of the best military know how in the in in the world. They, they will be important members of the European Union after this war is over. Uh, and uh, uh, an important part, allies. Let's, on the nuclear thing, let me make sure we understand. Putin's nuclear arsenal means that the United States does not and never will have any plans or intention or thought of invading Russia. The Russian people are completely safe against foreign invasion because of their robust nuclear arsenal. And I wish we could tell them that Putin's, Putin's propaganda that Ukraine is an existential threat to Russia is just a lie, and the and the proof of it is no, we would we would not start a nuclear war. And I'm, I, I'd like to kind of close on 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 the question. You know, we had we've had a lot of talk about why we are polarized. In, we in America, we seem to have become more polarized uh, in our dec in dec in, the, in recent decades. And there are a lot of theories, and and nothing is proven yet. I would argue that one of the theories that's moving up in my estimation is the lack of of, of an international adversary that we're afraid of, uh, because we we do have something to worry about now with with Russian aggression like like this. We do have a reason to fight this, and it did briefly it did originally show uh, in, in the halls of Congress with 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 the Republicans and Democrats working together in support of Ukraine, having argued that the amount we're spending is a trivial fraction of our defense spending. And by the standards of which we judge our defense spending, it's doing more for making a better world, the, which is what our defense is for, than, than, than any other 80, 75, $80 billion a year that we've been spending. Uh, so I think any opposition to this is based purely on, on a sense that, well, a democratic administration is doing it, therefore we should argue against it. 
that's exactly what we didn't do in the Cold War on, on major issues of international relations. As, as Mark has said, everything is in, in history is, is contingent. We, 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 we cannot predict what will happen, but I can only hope that, uh, that this very real challenge to the world order that has, has existed since February of 2022 uh, helps us as Americans to work together uh, uh, to be a, con a constructive force uh, in international relations. Peter, you studied civil society and have participated in efforts to strengthen it around the world. Do you agree that that's a, a factor in Ukraine? Have you seen that much have you, when, in your discussions with people over there? And I mean, I've, and I've been in Ukraine in the war. I was in Odessa uh, last September and also Moldova. Uh, but I think, you know, the notion that we, through our programs, can really change very much Um you know, it's it's a it's a vanity for us, and you know we're going to spend all this money building democracy. We don't we don't build democracy. You know, by by existing, by people coming to our universities, uh, yes, in, in that sense, we we provide an example. But to think that if we go out and tell these poor natives about you know help them build NGOs or tell them about democracy, or we make sure they can read the Federalist Papers which was a project uh, in, in your administration to put that in everybody's. Yes, that was a big one, yeah. And nobody ever checked them out. I would look in every library. You know, that wasn't really going to make a difference. So, yeah, civil society. Do you think the Ukrainians themselves sort of made some decision about this? Yes. About no, the Ukrainians are, are, are building civil society. Yeah. And that that is important. But but let's not say it's about us. Yeah. Well, um, I, I was there in 2014 I, advocating it. And I can sure as hell testify they didn't do it because I said so. Uh, <laughs> they they did it completely to... differently from the way I was ever talking about, but they did it, and that's what's important. I want to just say a word about uh, uh, about uh, nuclear weapons, which is really uh, uh, first uh, what happened in in uh, with the um, denuclearization of Belarus, uh, uh, Kazakhstan, and uh, Ukraine. These weapons were not usable by the Ukrainians. They were, uh, you know, on, on top of ICBMs. So I think there were 54 that they had. But but the other point is, in general, uh, I mean, I'm afraid Roger may be right that this and a number of other things could in, lead other, you know, lead to you know much more rapid nuclear proliferation, which we've largely avoided since 1945. But that said, nuclear war weapons are essentially unusable. I mean, Russia really can't use them in Ukraine. Uh, uh, it's not clear to me that Ukraine could have used them against Russia. Israel has them. They can't use them in Gaza. Uh, we, you know, we had them and, and we were, you know, basically our allies were defeated by, uh, uh, you know, the guys in pickup trucks in, uh, in Afghanistan and, and guys in pickup trucks in Iraq and Syria took huge amounts of of territory. So I just want to jump in on the question about nuclear weapons and disagree a little with Peter because I think that they do have some utility. It's, it is limited. And I think we see that in uh, this conflict that is Russia put down two red lines. One was no NATO troops in Ukraine. The other one was no invasion of the of Russian homeland. And we've respected those. We put down a red line, which was no strikes into NATO territory. Uh, and they've respected that despite the fact that I'm sure every lieutenant colonel on the general staff wants to strike our bases in Poland. I want to come back to what Roger said about, you know, politics and, and you know, that making all these things uh, partisan issues, that that that, that the the enemy, uh, it, it, you know, with opposing aid to Ukraine is not about getting, uh, uh, it's not about the Ukrainians, it's about getting Biden. And, and this has been going on for a long time, and it's not just in the United States. I, I watched the Brexit debate in Britain, and I have a number of friends who are conservative MPs. And I kept saying, you guys risk breaking up the, your country because Scotland it is not going to accept this the Brexit. Uh, and indeed, you know, there's a good likelihood that there'll be another referendum in Scotland and it'll vote for independence purely because of Brexit. They, they voted two to one to stay in the United Kingdom. And their answer was, Brexit is more important, and, and, and hey, if Scotland leaves, that's 61 fewer MPs against a conservative government. Uh, and, you know, we've come to a time, both in the United States and, and in Britain, where the political parties have become more important than the national interest. And, and I, I just, I, I, it's something I can't even understand. But, you know, that's where we are. 